And welcome to episode three of the Media Goon Show. Um, we're lucky enough tonight to be to be uh, joined by us, joined with us by uh, New York Channel One's Roger Clark. Roger's a great Mets fan. He's a great news reporter. I have a great time every time I get to spend spend some time with him on location. Um, I've had, he's also one of the reasons why I've become more comfortable in front of a mic and in front of a camera is because he's had me on so many times. Um, let me bring my uh, cohort in first, Dave Maggio. Hey, Dave. Hello. How are you? I'm um, warning everybody now. Dave is screwing up with his uh, mic, so if you hear any buzzing, it's all his fault. I hear nothing. And, uh, yeah, it's typical Maggio madness. So uh, without any further ado, I'm going to bring Roger in. Um, so I haven't seen Roger since last July in person. So here's Roger Clark. Hey, great, hey, to, Roger. great to see you. Yeah, that's right. We were um, at City Field talking about baseball coming back last year, and now it's coming back again, but a, a little bit bigger and better than it was last year for sure. Yeah, it, it's so crazy. Like, it, it's been a year, you know, with everything going on with the pandemic, but it doesn't feel like a year. But at the same time, it feels like a year. And it, it's just it's just crazy. And um, I, I just can't wait to actually watch baseball, whether if we get – tickets into the games or not I'm, I'm just happy to be able to say we got past one year already yeah i think it's definitely one of the top 10 things i i missed uh from last i mean we had actually and this is going to sound crazy as a mets fan since i'm a little kid growing up in queens but i had never been to mets spring training last year for the first time we were going to port st Lucie. you know i have my son jack who i'm sure you've seen on facebook and stuff he's a huge baseball freak we we had the tickets to a game we were going. My mom moved to Delray Beach. We were close. It was going to be, you know, like kill two birds with one stone, see mom, go to a Mets spring training, and bang. And that was it. And it was just, I mean, and that was only the beginning, obviously, at that point. But, boy, it, and then everything everything just came. But, I, you know, so that was one of the things. I was like, darn, I was so close to finally going to Mets spring training. So hopefully by maybe next year, you know. You know, spring training is a, a lot of fun. Dave actually goes down a lot. Um uh, when he's down there, he's my running around buddy. We, we've done some cool stuff down there. We've met some players like before the game. Um, he's brought players artwork that he's done. Uh, last year, he wasn't able to go down. I had to do a, a special run down to Tom's River, where he's from, to go get a TIFO because he's the TIFO guy for the seven line. And we were bringing it down to spring training. So I'm in possession of the only TIFO that was made from 2020 for the Big for the right. Mets. We got to put it on eBay and just title it rare. Like, rare. <laughs> rare. One and only. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I hope that you're able to go next year. So it, yeah, it, it's I mean, a lot of, it's a yeah. lot of fun. I, this is embarrassing to admit, but I have been to spring training, but my grandparents were from the Bronx and I, my grandmother took me one day to Yankee spring training when they used to do it in Fort Lauderdale. We took like two buses there. And I actually caught a foul ball during the game. And this is, you know, kind of a mushy story. But when my grandmother died, I actually put the ball in her coffin because it was like a moment. Now, all right, that being said, I would have rather been a Mets spring training. But she lived near Fort Lauderdale and the Mets were up in Tampa at that time. So it was different. If she, they were born in St. Lucie, we might have been able to go there. Yeah, you know what? But at least you got to go to a spring training, which is a totally different vibe than going to a regular, a regular like, in-season game. So even if it was the Yankees, you're still having fun. So. We're not going to fault you for that. Yeah, you know what? You know what I remember the most about that trip, though. You guys are going to think this is crazy. A little pop culture thing was on the way. We were going. Uh, I think it was through like Pompano Beach on like a you know it was like a bu- like you know, public bus, and there was an Esther Roll Boulevard, as in the woman who played the mother on Good Times. Yeah. And I just remember saying to my grandmother, "Oh my God, this named after Esther Roll." And she's like, "Who's Esther Roll?" And I was like, "Forget it." You know. But it, James, James, James. But it was just random like that. It was a, that it was a street named after Esther Roll. Like maybe she was from there. I guess I don't know. I don't know, but that that's great that that's uh, <laughs> that, that's something yeah. that you were able to pick up because that's something I would pick up too. You know, and be like, oh wow, it's the mother from Good Times. I can't believe it. Right. You know, it's like how was Yankee Spring Training? Ah, it kind of sucked, but I got to see Esther Roll Boulevard. You know, <laughs> so that just made your spring training right down there, even if. So, so you wouldn't have been able to see that at the at uh, Port St. Lucie, so That's you're fair. good. There may be a, like a random street named after some random TV star at that place, too, but who knows? 
<laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, Alan Hale Jr. Boulevard. <laughs> Is that it? Well, good. Oh, man, the skipper. I miss him. Yeah, that that's such a, you know, beloved show. But I know the kids don't watch, you know, all the reruns that we watch when we were kids. So, like, all these pop culture re- references, at least, you know, you get it. Majo gets it. I can't talk to kids like my cousin's my cousin's kids. Everything I say goes right over their head now. It's kind of a bummer, though, right? I mean, like, little, like, all these, like, because we watch those shows over and over and over. We have so many references, like Brady Bunch, Gilligan's Island, Bewitched, Adam's Family, Monsters. And my kid, like, he's, he's just no clue. No clue. We could talk Paw Patrol. That's about it. <laughs> the only thing about Paw Patrol I know is I think I might have uh, a, a jersey from uh, from uh, the Brooklyn Cyclones that I got. That's that's the only thing I know about Paw Patrol. But you know, I'm also not a parent, so. Did they have a Paw Patrol night? Yeah. They. Did. <laughs> I didn't realize that. You know, one uh, one day I think for a story for you, you might have to go down to my the rabbit hole of my jerseys of the whole collection I have. Oh, I'd love to. I, I have uh, I have retail uh, turn ahead the clock jerseys. So I, I got like two Mercury Mets and I got most of the teams. I'm missing like probably about five teams. But I have a Boston Red Sox that they never wore signed by Brett Saberhagen. Oh, gosh. <laughs> what was he, Mr. – what was it, the bleach detergent? What did he do? He did something yeah. in the club? Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, no, all right. That was those were dark times. I thought like the last those were dark, and in the past couple of years before last year it was pretty dark. And could, could you imagine social media back then? Oh, Everybody I, would be canceled. Yeah, that was. A, I mean, that, I hate to say, it, but those teams were. That was a, a lot of really kind of a bunch of knuckleheads back then. That wasn't. Yeah, yeah Not, that's that made it hard. Like if I was a kid, you know, or a teenager, or running around there. But it's like. I remember I'm like, I really don't want to root for these guys. Yeah, that's when it gets bad, though. You hate that, though, when, you know, when the, you know like, it kind of has also happens to me a bunch with the Knicks, too. Like, where you, maybe it's the ownership, but I, where you just dislike the team and certain players that you don't really, you know, it's obviously we're always going to root for the colors. We're always going to root for the jerseys, right? But there are times, especially, well, thank God this ownership change because I feel so much better now rooting for the team you know but it was rough uh, you know rooting for for you know when there's not likable players and not likable ownership at the same time now for sure i have to say the past couple like 2019 i went to more mets games than i had been to in years one because obviously my son loves baseball but the other part of it is i like them i like a lot so i like the grub i like you know you want to go see these guys i like conforto so it's neat to have finally a good bunch of core guys that you could say i like these guys you know what i mean it's like yeah homegrown homegrown core guys that like you watch grow up in front of you coming from the minors and coming up and you're like oh this is great this is a team we didn't try to go out and go on the bargain bin to go pick up guys we actually drafted well and did little trades and pickups here and there and we have a team that it's like, hey, you know what? I can get behind these guys. You can tell that they want to win. They want to play well. They want to. They actually like being in New York. There, there have been some guys that have been on this team. You could tell they couldn't wait to get out of the city. Yeah, I mean, and, and look, we we know it's not for everybody. I mean, I think it goes way back to when I was like really little, and like the Mets got George Foster, and he like had been ripping it up for the Reds, and then he comes here and he stinks, and I was like a good example for me that was one of the first real big times where i was like wow man not everybody is good and then of course when the 86 team came around and you got guys like hernandez and carter who come here and just like excel and embrace the atmosphere and what the mets fans have to offer that's when you love it and then of course piazza did the same thing and 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 now you hope lindor does it right you know (laughs) yeah i mean i because Lindor was over in Cleveland, I didn't really pay too much attention to him. I knew his name. I knew his stats. You know, and like that, that I'm a stat head. But you, it's kind of hard to miss what he what he did, you know, over there offensively and defensively. But the personality that he has, I'm loving what, what he is, you know, when he's over here. And, like, he, he looks like he's enjoying the game. He enjoys being with the people. Imagine if, like, we actually had full crowds, what kind of, like, what kind of player he'd be with the uh, with the fans everywhere? 
Yeah, it's almost a shame. And I don't know if Dave, if you agree, like, you know, if we had like, it's too bad that this the year we got him wasn't the year where we're, when there's not a pandemic still, you know, right? I mean, but that being said, I mean, hopefully, you know, as the summer goes by, I mean, obviously, it's not going to go away right away. But I think, yeah, but it would have been great to have that place 45,000 opening day, introducing Lindor and the whole place just goes, you know, ape crazy there. Yeah, speaking about opening day, you know, we got the press release yesterday about that the uh, the stadium can have eight thousand fans in it as of now for opening day. The possibility that there could be more. Um, a lot of people were asking, like, how how are the tickets were going to be doled out, and um, it actually is pretty fair that anybody that had a long, you know, long time ticket plan, they're getting choice first. Um, but the only thing I didn't like was that they just kept pushing and selling tickets and they never had a plan of how many people were going to be able to get into the stadium. So now you have nothing but credits all over the place. Yeah. I think you remember seeing like those ads during the games last year. And I actually, I hate to say it. I used to kind of laugh when it happened because I was, they were like, you know, get your season tickets now for 2021. And I'm like, well, whoa, 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 hold on. <laughs> Do we even know there is going to, we didn't know where things were heading. No. And, yeah, so it is kind of in a way, and look, we all get those calls from the Mets ticket reps, and you're like, yeah, okay. I mean, look, I want to go to ball games too, but I wasn't certainly wasn't going to jump on and, and buy and, and go too crazy about buying tickets, which it's just too unpredictable, you know. I mean, yeah, I would like to be there those early days, but it, I don't know. Yeah, Keith, good point. I mean, I don't know how they're going to do it. <laughs> you know, I I gave up my half season plan. Not la- well, last season would have been the first season without it, and I kept my seven-line ticket plan because I just had issues with the security guards at City Field and just their customer service, and it just drove me crazy. So I'm like, why am I going to keep giving money to this team if they're going to treat a ticket holder that's had a plan for 10 years like this, and I'm just going to keep my seven-line tickets? And then I'm sitting there. I'm like, thank God I got rid of my tickets. You know, yeah. I wouldn't want to have to, to deal with the refund, the rollover with the credits. And even with what we're dealing with for opening day, it's like, hey, we know we already gave you your tickets, but we're going to pull them back. And um, you might be able to get tickets. If not, you're going to have to roll over the credit to, you know, when you can actually use it. So it, it's just crazy. Yeah. I mean, I guess that, you know, in their minds, they have to keep making money and they have to keep the fan base. <laughs> intact and to a certain extent so but that being said it's like come on you know i i, I don't know I, it's, it's strange i think they have to they should be going you know piecemeal at the same time as the rest of society is right not jumping too far ahead you know but, but I, mean, I guess that's look face it it's a corporation right i mean we we, we know it whether it is an old owners or new owners it's always going to be very corporate even the people who work for the team when you you know when you deal with them for the most part you know it's that's just it's always like that you know now inside Keith I don't know it's a little different like I've always been an advocate of if there's half a play crowd there you like let the people at the upper deck come down and, and sit in the boot seats I don't understand why you watch the games you see those good seats behind home plate and no one's there let them go find a kid and bring him down that's did you what ever hear doing did, did you ever hear their their reasoning for it no, I was just going to say, what that? why? Why don't they ever... So get- their reasoning for it is that the people that have those seats paid good money for those seats. And if they were to let people come down, even in, say, the seventh inning, you never know when the people that have those seats are going to come in. So they don't want them... This, this is what they've been telling us for years. Me and my cousin from Mets Police, we've been fighting with them for years about it. We've been, you know, all the different stuff we've gone toe to toe with the Mets about with customer relations. It, it's just amazing. It's just like, all right, fine. If you don't want to put them behind home plate, there's tons of seats, you know, behind, behind uh, the first baseline b- behind the dugouts that aren't being used, especially seventh inning at like on a cold night in April, just let people go down, but it, it's crazy. And then they don't stop. The other thing is like that drives me crazy with the ushers is that they don't stop people for going down to their seats during at bats anymore. Oh yeah, that's I yeah I agree yeah because all of a sudden like you know Mister Mister Johnson with eight things of popcorn and, and he's like excuse me Barbie excuse me and you're missing a great at bat you know yeah I, I I'm with you on that one too. It, all it is, and they're like um, that's was the other thing they told me was uh, because uh, you know the ushers they they're 
you know, people start yelling at them. Like, well, you put signs up and go, you, you're not permitted during at bats. That's it. You know, it takes it out of the usher's hands for having to, to admonish people. And people love to see written signs. I think, Once they, they see, you know, in, we went to Pittsburgh for a couple of mm-hmm. games two summers ago and they had, they were holding the whole, it, the, like, yep. it was perfect. And you get yeah. the message very quickly. You can see it from like, you know, 15 feet away. You're like, all right, okay, I'm not, you know, that's actually a great idea, you know. Now, do you want to hear their counter with this one? Um, well, with the union, <laughs> the union contract with the uh, ushers, they are, uh, they don't have to hold up any signs and it's against their contract. Now, you know, I'm a union guy and I understand that, but all right, fine. You, they don't want to hold it up, place it right on top of, right where the sun, what the uh, numbers are on the railing. Yeah. It's a no brainer. I mean, yeah, it just, it's, it just makes it, like you said, you know, and I think that's the problem a lot of times is that the, the team doesn't talk to us <laughs> about the fan experience. They do these, I don't know, they must do some kind of like, you know, you know, the, the, you know, they go with computer stuff and they go through like, you know, do surveys and things like that. But when it comes down to it, what they should do is call guys like you and Dave and, and say, all right, what, what do you like and what do you not like? And, and, and go from there, you know? Well, I am on the Mets fan advisory board, believe it or not. That's but, right. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm on that thing. And uh, it, it, it's crazy that, you know, it's more for like the – it's more of a focus group than really an advisory board. But, That's the words I was looking for before when I had a brain fart. There. <laughs> yeah. Um, but <laughs> there, there's enough people in the Mets organization that reach out to me at times when they read my blog – at the media goon.com for anybody that doesn't know. Um, so Dave, that's how you promote. I keep trying to tell you, um, so, you know, they, they do reach out to me and tell me why their reasons are for doing stuff, but they also don't reach out and go, Hey, we're thinking about doing this. What do you think about it? And it, if you re- reach out to people like me, Darren, my cousin, then there's a, about five or six other fans that go to a ton of games that know how it is. It would make life so much easier for the Mets organization. Yeah, I think the I think the last game I went of 2019, I had I, I had a problem with the they didn't staff enough security that night at the gates, and we went through. I don't know for the whole season, I was having a great luck going through the um, bullpen gate. And that night, it was really bad. And I screwed up. I confess that I got there, you know, a little too close to game time, and I should know better. But we missed, I think, three innings, and it was pretty rough. I was like, wow. I just felt like there had to be a better way, you know? There's no reason to lose three innings closer to game time because by that time, majority of the people should be in. So if you're going to close down gates, at least put up signs, hey, everybody go to this gate. Um, and then you staff it appropriately. Don't spread it out where like you have two security guards at each gate instead of just opening three of the gates and you know staffing it the right right amount of people. Yeah, I think that's right. And now, of course, I tweeted out like, "Way to go, Mets! I'm missing the game." And people are like, "Well, you should have showed up early." <laughs> Which is hey, like, who, I get who knows? Who knows? You might have been out doing your job, doing a story. So you got to show up. You you show up when you can show up. Yeah, it was one of those nights. I mean, like, you know, he's into – Jack's really into now getting there early and trying to get foul balls. So we've been, like, ridiculously – almost to the point where we're too early for some games. Like, you know, I'm like, wow, there's no lines at defenders. This is great. But that night, you know, it just happened to be, you know, we just run it a little late, blah, 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 and then you're screwed, you know, so that you don't like that to happen, you know. Yeah, Joseph Green even says getting fans in quickly is an issue. That That does happen, especially, like, on giveaway days. They're a mess. Oh my god! And while well, they're waiting, you know that it's weird. It's it's funny. There's like phases. Like it's a long line to get in, like an hour and a half before the game for the you know to get the whatever they're giving away. Then it's good. And then when you get closer to game time, it gets bad again. So really, you got it's almost like you have to be like, all right, I don't want what they're giving away. I'm gonna wait for that group to go in, and then I'm gonna go in quick, and then you're good. You know. Yeah, I think one of the ways they can like actually fix that is anybody that's a season ticket holder that has a plan should just get the giveaways, either mail to them or go to the. Um, there's um, I don't know if they still have it, but there's a season ticket holder lounge over by the kids, um, City Field, and they should just hold hold the giveaways in there. Like, hey, we packaged up these giveaways for this week. Here, here's all your giveaways. We packaged up for you this week. Here's all your giveaways. Don't 
but give them an, a, a section that they come in where they don't get the giveaways that day until they come in and pick it up from the uh, from the uh, the season ticket holder lounge. It's actually a good idea, you know, pending there's no line inside, but there probably won't be. And that's actually, and then you're eliminating a whole bunch of people who are, you know, waiting to get it just to get whatever they're giving away. It's right. Yeah, it's, ah, it's crazy. I mean, I, that being said, I still can't wait to go. But <laughs> Oh, same here. You know, I know I'm going to end up missing opening day because of work. But my wife is just like, she's like, I can't wait to go. I, I can't wait to go. She goes, are we getting tickets? What's going on? I'm like, just, I'm like, read my blog. <laughs> I've gotten to that point with her. I'm like, just read the blog. It'll tell you everything. I actually got, we drove by, uh, this was crazy. My, he had, he had baseball practice in Mount Vernon of all places. And we we're in the Upper East Side. And, he, the, the, you know, they, they sent us through Queens to get to, because there was a jam up on 95. Mm-hmm. So we passed by City Field and he said, he actually, and, you know, not to get mushy, but he was like, Oh, City Field, Dad. When are we gonna go? And then I actually got like kind of a tear in my hearing my son say that that we mit- went a whole, like literally. That's the first summer I didn't see a baseball game since what? Since I was seven years old, you know. And to hear my son say that, I'm driving. And I'm like, oh, I stop right now. <laughs> 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 but, but yeah, you know, it's like it really is. You know, for when it's part of your life, you know, it's 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 crazy. It really, you know, it's it's something. And then you, all the complaining we've been doing and. And we've complained about the team a crap load over the years. You still want to be there, you know. It's it's great. Well, that's the, that's the thing. Like a majority of my adult like adult friends that I've become friends with over the years, I've met through the Mets. Most of my wedding party were were people I met through the Seven Line. You know, it, it's crazy. Like Dave, I met through the Seven Line, and we've become really good friends. And and it's just like that whole baseball community. It's. I miss seeing everybody. I'm like, we still, you know, keep in touch and everything, but it's not the same. Yeah, no, it's, you know, and, and it's weird. You know, I, I've been, I talk about the Mets with my Mets buddies too, but yeah, I mean, the idea, actually, you know, this guy I went to high school with he, the other day, he said we should catch a Mets game. And we realized that we had never gone to a Mets game together, just like randomly missed each other. So we're planning on going. So that's going to be a bit, that's one of the big events I'm looking forward to if we ever get there. But yeah, you're right. It's, it's such a, it's crazy how much how much we 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 love the team and we love the experience of being part of it and love being part of this family that is you know that are Mets fans. Um, so it's you know and that's what you, that was a big part of what we missed. You know you missed the baseball, of course. You missed the players. You missed the ballpark, but you also missed the people. You know. Yeah, and that's like and that's like one of the reasons why we did the QBC all these years. It's because in the wintertime, there wasn't anything for anybody to do that were, you know, a part of our Mets family. And I'll call it our extended family that are now people that come to the QBC, you know, and it that's it, I miss that this year. You know, I miss seeing you at the QBC. I miss seeing Maggio at the QBC, like just to see everybody having so much fun hanging out and just be talking about baseball. And during the off season, it, it's just like. I'm not going to lie. This year has been rough, you know, just not being able to just hang out with people. And on the positive side, I, at least I still know that everybody that I'm friends with are still around. And I like I haven't talked to you really since July, you know. Yeah. I mean, I always feel like I see you. Thank God, you know, the social media has its good, good points and bad points. And the, the good point is keeping us connected in some ways, you know, the other things like politics and stuff like that that's another issue but uh, when you're able to i think it was it was even more important this year than ever you would either discuss it at what you saw on social media because it got too political and crazy and it was a very polarized divisive nation the past year uh, or you were thank god oh this guy's okay you know <laughs> because you just yeah. have, every because look it was no joke every other day you know you you, you just didn't know what was going to happen so and and you know, not to get serious, but it really was, you know, it was that kind of kind of situation. You know? Yeah. And I was looking, I looked at the, uh, when I texted you the other day to, to jump on, which I'm very happy that you jumped on with us. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, you know, it's just weird having like this other side where I'm the one hosting and not, and asking the questions versus how you usually <laughs> have me on. <laughs> it always feels natural though. Cause I feel like we've talked so many times on TV. So it's like, you know, yeah, so I, I looked at the I looked at the text. I'm like, wow, I haven't texted Roger in, in since July. Like that, that's just crazy. Yeah. Uh, it goes. It, I mean, I'm not gonna say it, it definitely was a long year, but also like you know we've we've been working a lot. So, which I'm obviously thankful and grateful that I've you know been able to work. But 
because of the setup, you know, being working. Well, like I'm always out in the field every day, but then we come home to do what we do. And when you get, you know, the work gets bigger when, when the, your hours get longer and there's no boundaries. So it's, it seems like it's just been nonstop, you know? So, like I said, I'm thankful that, to, that I was state employed, but it's been a lot of, you know, been a lot of work and it doesn't give you much time to do anything else. I was thinking to myself, if I had uh, like the things that I had pre pandemic, like I play softball and I play in a little band and I never would have been able to make it to any like practices or, or anything because of work. Which is like, you don't know now. So it's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, would I have been working this much if it wasn't for the pandemic? And then I still would have been. It's like, who knows? It's just been, it's crazy. It's crazy. Well, since you brought up your band, perfect segue. Because I've been looking for a way to, to lead into it. I've never been able to catch a, a concert when you guys are doing a show. I've never been able to catch a show. I'm always working, you know, 100 hours a week. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. And then, like, you know, one of the, the few times, like, you've had a, a Saturday show, I, I couldn't make it because I was either recovering from working all those hours yeah. or I had to go go do something. But um, how how long have you been playing the drums? Ah, I st- well, it's weird. I started, uh, I was I was well, in the seventh grade band at uh, Russell Sage Junior High in, in Forest Hills. Um, I was played in the band from, with Mr. Pav. At first, I played saxophone. I was terrible, so I switched the drums. And then at the end of seventh grade, I went to Mr. Pav and I said, Mr. Pav, I want to be an eighth grade band. And he said, Roger, you have no rhythm. Forget it. I went up in like <laughs> printing shop. So I was making rubber stamps and I was really bitter about it. But I kept the drumsticks. And like flat, fast forward like five years in high school, the bunch of guys, we were in the lunchroom and, uh, and the guys were like, yeah, hey, we're going to start a band. And I said, oh, I have drumsticks. They're like, you're the drummer. <laughs> And that was it. So like, yeah, and then I self-taught, you know, and I just learned over the years. So it's been fun. But it was I still I, I hope Mr. Pav knows that I, I think I have a little more rhythm than I did in seventh grade. Just a little more. Yes. Yeah, I, I actually um, I was going through um, I looked up your band, which is uh, Perp Walk, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I was actually, you know, looking it up the other day and um, I pulled Pop up a couple up. pictures from Hanks. Hanks is no longer with us, sadly. Yeah, so if anybody wants to listen to something cool, it's it's pretty good. The uh, the music, Perp uh, Walk. Yeah, it's fun if you're into like uh, p- rock, punky rock. It's pretty fun stuff, you know. Quirky, uh, yeah, Bunny, we- our bass player, writes a lot of lyrics, and they're kind of like she's she travels a lot, so she's she writes about like she was like in some like uh, like a campsite on the beach in Colombia, and like she woke up in the middle of the night and rats had raided the place. <laughs> So and they were like eating everybody's like knapsacks and M&Ms and snacks and stuff. So she wrote this song called Rats. And that's one of our songs. So almost every song is like some crazy experience she had traveling the world. So it's kind of cool. So it was like Lower East Side in the 80s. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> we would have fit in perfectly. Trust me. No, but, <laughs> but no, but it's weird. My, uh, but my guitar player is a great story. His name is Joe O'Carroll. He's a retired detective with the NYPD Harbor Unit. And he was the, the musical director for the emerald society pipes and drums for like years so and he traveled the world so it's funny when we play these little tiny clubs and i say i'm nervous he's like why i played carnegie hall like literally he played like in some of the biggest because you know especially after 9 11 they every, they were invited everywhere so he was so he plays bagpipes but he also plays great guitar <laughs> wow plays two instruments i can't even play one i know I, I can't figure out what are these days i've never actually attempted bagpipes but it looks really hard and it looks heavy. I don't know, but I, I love that sound. It's great. Yeah, I, I don't think I I don't think I have the lung capacity for it. <laughs> like, I feel like I pass out. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah, I, I, when uh, Keith told me you were going to be on, I was like, oh, I'm going to look up a little bit and uh, see what you know what you're into or that stuff. I saw the band thing. I'm like, oh, he's a drummer. That's great. And then the story you just told is like literally exactly my way of, of playing the drums as well like i was in the school band in like fourth and fifth grade where they call it like the quote-unquote orchestra and you know you sit there and you have to you know the hardest thing you do is what like uh, play a paradiddle or it's just like you know, right like, yeah like, <laughs> and then you know i was just, always wanted to play the drums always like the rhythm of it but it was just like well drum sets are loud and expensive so we'll play guitar so i learned guitar for probably i guess i started picking up when i was like 12 13 i guess and played through high school, I didn't get my first drum set until I think I was 23 or something, and 
just finally started playing with it. It's just like, well, then if I'm not in a band, there's nowhere to really set up a drum set. Then yeah, like, it's tough. And there's really nowhere to set up a drum set. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm always jealous of the people in the suburbs who have like a big like garage or uh, like a uh, basement area. They have you're like, yeah, my drum, my whole music room is down there. And I'm like, really? You have a music room? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like not in my apartment. I'm like, <laughs> not here either. I know. Well, that's one thing about this whole, you know, like, you know, I'm, do, I'm doing my work in the bedroom and my, you know, my, my wife is getting frustrated because like whenever she needs something, I'm always about to go like three, two, one. Oh, what? <laughs> the door flies. Open. Well, that's like, I try to do this show either Friday or Saturday. It's whatever night Trish is working late. So that way I don't have to worry about her coming in and really getting her to the bedroom. Right. Yeah. So do it. It's weird so, how your boss has thought about stuff like that. Like, the, you know, like, I feel like I, I want to send my boss. I was like, could you, like, get us? Uh, is there a chance you could get us also the apartment next door? So we, as my workplace, because it, we, <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's crazy. Hey, I just need you to expand my closet just a little bit and soundproof it. That's the only the only thing I need. Right. Then I'm good. You know, it's like, yeah, it's crazy, though. But then, no, I really am jealous. You know, I have buddies who like, you know, who, you know, everybody makes their pick in life. Right. Some of us stay in more of a city. And, you know, and, you know, like some of them, I, I've gone to their homes, like out in Jersey and stuff, or Long Island. They have like, their, they actually have an office, like an official office that they walk in, like, and they'll be like, okay, wife, kids, you may not, don't, don't bother me. I'm working. Close the door. Bang. That's it. And I'm like, that's crazy. I can't even like, like fathom that, you know, it's impossible. And, and then you got somebody like my cousin who has, uh, he lives in a sitcom. I, I, he has three kids, his wife. And he uh, goes down to record stuff in the basement and he has his own office, like off the basement. That's, you know, got soundproofing, got a door, it's closed, everything. But the only thing is that's where the, the uh, washing machine is. Oh, no. So <laughs> the wife comes down right when he's about to, he's in a flow. You know how it is. Like you're, you're going for 20 minutes and you're like in a nice like pace going, going, going. And then you hear the, the washing machine go off. Or his wife comes down or the kids come down and like, hey, we can't work the printer even though we're all teenagers and we don't know how to load the paper. Can you come up and load the paper? And he's just like, I, I, I'm working. They're like, right. Yeah, but we don't know how to work the printer. You're all almost in college. Learn how to work the print. Oh, my God. Yeah, no, it's really – it's it's the craziest – I mean – you know, I feel bad. Oh, my wife, though, because she's like she's become like the IT person for me and my son, because I I mean, I knew how to use a computer and stuff. But I have like they gave me, a, a, a you know, an iPad to bring home to do editing on. And then I have this like Microsoft Surface for the other stuff. And and this one's not working. And then this one goes down and you're like, ah, it's just it's 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 absolutely bonkers. It's you. Oh, man, I never would have predicted this one, you know, that a pandemic well, would bring this on us, you know. Yeah, what about with the uh, – and when your internet service provider just like fall, fails and it's just like, what am I going to do now? My hotspot, I only have so many so many megs on my hotspot. I can't really you know, do anything too crazy with it. Yeah. I, it, it, it's, I, yeah, I mean really it's crazy because it you, you really is you're, – you're, you're, you're helpless, right? I mean you're basically helping, you know. And you can't even like say, oh, well, I'll go down to Starbucks. They have Wi-Fi because right. – Can't go. You can't go to Starbucks. <laughs> Not that I would they want to go to Starbucks anyway, but you know. Well, they don't even have the the Wi-Fi on. You know, some spots where you can't even sit outside with the Starbucks, like you used to be able to. Yeah. Well, they want. Yeah, they don't want any people gathering or anything like that, which is strange. It's very. It's uh, you know, some places you feel like there's more gathering than others, and some are working try harder to keep it out. And like this bench, they have like you know a sticker on the bench: "Don't sit here." You know. <laughs> well, it's like every time I pass Trader Joe's over in Glendale, there's always. Uh, a line outside and there's always, you know, six feet in between everybody, but it's every day from opening to closing, there's always a line. And I'm sure there's only like five people in the store at a time. Do you guys understand that? I mean, like, I know like apparently Trader Joe's has like, you know, there's certain lo like people are like, Oh, they have the best this, they have the best that. But like, I don't get the waiting. I mean, I just get a key food. There's the line. Like I, if I, I, I don't, it doesn't make any sense to me. The whole foods and Trader Joe's thing. I don't get it. I, I, I really, I don't know. They just opened the. I'm in Jersey, so I'm like central, southern Jersey, and they opened the Trader Joe's relatively close to us. About, I don't know, it's a little before the pandemic uh, started, and I remember everybody was losing their mind. Like Trader Joe's, you got to go, and there's a Whole Foods that's 45 minutes. Away. You got to go, you got. I'm like, 
I feel like I go to these places, you drop a hundred bucks, and I come out with a bag and a half of food. <laughs> like, yeah, there's a place called like Aldi and ShopRite. They're just as good. <laughs> it's like everything is okay. Just don't get the rotten fruit. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the Man- I know you guys have ever been to like a you know supermarket in Manhattan. They're a little smaller, obviously, because there's less yeah. space. The aisles are squishy. Like I do, you know, because I spent ten years up in the Hudson Valley and Central New York for you know, trying to get back home. So you know, we had Stop and Shop and Wegmans and all giant aisles and everything. So I I have to confess, I did. You know, there was a, t- a time when I missed that, but. The Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, even the Fairway. I mean, I know they have great stuff. Don't get me wrong. No, no offense, but I just don't see myself waiting online to get it. No. Well, I used to when I when I did TV commercials, I used to walk all the way around um, Union Square, and like that, it keeps changing its name. But at one point, it was like a Grand Union. Then it became might be a Stop and Shop now. But whatever store is down there, I couldn't even walk th- through the aisles like. Normally, I had to walk sideways like Razor Ramon, <laughs> going like this. So that way, I didn't knock stuff over. Yeah, it's it's it, and it's it, it brings up you know you always like there's always that joke. You remember like Mr. Mom when like the or was it Married to the Mob where they're all crashing the, the carts together? But you you, you gotta it's gonna happen. You know you get dirty looks and everything. But in the Manhattan ones, the small ones, forget about it. It's like even worse. I was going to say, though, there's, there is like I always say I would never wait online for something. There's only probably one place I wait a lot is Utopia Bagels. Like over in Queens, there's a lot of those bagels are damn good. I'm sorry. Right, right by St. John's. Yeah. I mean, they're just I mean, so it'll go like a little out the door. And I, I yeah, that that's one thing I have to confess. I will wait for those bagels. They're good. Yeah. I used to go down there when I was in St. John's. Yeah, I mean, just good stuff. I mean, you know, it's like, because, you know, there's less, ba- I feel like there's fewer really good bagel places than there used to be, you know? Um, there's a couple that popped up in the story now, like uh, Brooklyn Bagel, bagel Company, and there's a, another oh, one. Oh, fan, too. Yeah, he, my, pa- my parents ran into him up in the Catskills, and they just started talking to him out of nowhere, and they had no idea who he was, and he's like, yeah, uh, I opened up over in a story, you should come by, and I'm like, what the? How does this happen? Yeah, they make good bagels, and they're funny on their social media. Guys, a great guy, and whenever I say another bagel store is good, he just writes to me in caps, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sorry. No, they really have. They're really good. They have great bagels there. But I also, yeah, you know, down the road, a story of bagels I like too. Yeah, yeah. There, there's a couple of good ones in the story. I mean, it takes me maybe 10, 15 minutes to drive over to one, but it's worth it. Yeah. Over by you, though, there's, is there any bagel stores left? Not really. Yeah. I mean, uh, we had we have, you know, like there was Alpha Donut over on Queens Boulevard that would have yeah. bagels. Every, but there, there's nothing. I mean, there's not even a good deli in my neighborhood anymore. Yeah, it's just to get a, like a nice big hero sandwich like Sal, Chris and Charlie's in the store, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's where I hit a lot, too. I That was during 2015, the World Series and the playoffs. I would come in with 10 sandwiches for the tailgate and just put them out for everybody, cut them up into sections. Those things are ridiculous. I mean, like, I, I feel like you you eat, if you eat, actually eat the full sandwich, like you pass out. Like it's like almost like a sleeping pill. <laughs> uh, I've, d- I've done it. I've done it a few times. <laughs> Dude, like you have that much salami. Like there's no way you're like staying awake. You know, it's like get any, you know. it's good going down. Yeah. Delicious, you know. Yeah. Oh, well, let's, let's – I think we got our first troll. We gooning. Okay. Um, Mets are cheaters. I don't know how they said that. And uh, ban Carlos Beltran. Okay, he's not with the Mets, so I, I just felt like you know, talking to the trolls, they don't really bother me. Ban Carlos Beltran. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are actually being taught to think that he should somehow be back as part of the organization, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, do I think he should be totally out of baseball? No. Do I think he has to earn his way back in? Yeah, I think he. I think he should. Uh, have to go ride a bus and single a ball for a little bit. Yeah, awesome. no, I mean, that's that sounds like a good I'd like to have to work it. Yeah, I would say that it almost sounds like Major League Five uh, working your way back. <laughs> <laughs> that, he cheated and now he's got to, you know, like that's so crazy that whole thing. I can't. And, and isn't it weird how that whole scandal like went away because of the pandemic? It would I, it would have been such a different season with the app for the Astros if that didn't happen. If like you know, and it's it's kind of silly to, to to think about something so inconsequential as 
what they're you know between, with the pandemic going on but i think the reaction to them would be totally different people had a chance to forget about it by the time the 60 game season started yeah it's also just like how people have forgotten about uh, a certain second baseman for the mets i don't even know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> they forget that his contract is for two more years and they're like oh good we're you know we're rid of him like no you got uh cano for two walker? more years <laughs> no, <I'm kidding>. <laughs> walk <laughs> You know how many Walker jerseys I have that every game used? <laughs> oh, man. I thought he was going to be the next big thing. I don't know what happened. <laughs> nah, we should have kept Murphy. Oh, my God. I mean, you know, that right? isn't that like, really? I mean, that was like, come on. The guy went like crazy in the playoffs. It, it, he's obviously showing his worth. All right, so he'll boot a couple of balls at second base. Who cares if you're going to hit like that? And they got rid of him. And then, of course, he was on a mission to kill us for the next three years, right? You know? Yeah, I'll off the air. I'll tell you the reason why they really got rid of him. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So the other thing I've always been curious about with you, because you brought it up about how you were uh, up north trying to work your way back, is how did you decide that you wanted to become a news reporter? Um, you know, it's funny. I actually, which you probably figured out, originally I was going to do sports. You know, I went to Syracuse. I did the whole track. You know, I looked up to Bob Costas and Marv Albert and all these guys who had gotten, I actually read a, an article in sports illustrated. I think my senior year of high school that talked about how all these sports casters all went to the same college. I knew Syracuse, but I was more of a St. John's fan back there. And I, I, and I was like, Oh, well that sounds like someplace I should go. Cause I wanted to be, you know, and then when I got to college, I kind of veered off more into news somehow uh, at that point. So that's what happened. But I always knew I wanted to be in broadcasting in some way. So, but back then it was a little bit different. There was new New York. They didn't have a New York one yet. It hadn't started yet. So we were told in journalism school, like you have to start small, kind of like Carlos Beltran riding the bus, <laughs> and then, <laughs> then work your way, you know, work your way up. So I was in Oneonta for two years. I was in um, Newburgh, New York, for a couple of years, and I was in White Plains for ten months. <laughs> went back up to Poughkeepsie, worked in radio in Poughkeepsie at uh, WPDH, which a lot of people know it's a great rock and roll station up in the Poughkeepsie area. And then I uh, got into TV up there and then I wound up in New York one in 2001. But it took me almost 10 years, you know, to get back home. It was crazy. Well, and it's something that's crazy about it is that I remember when, when you started on New York one, because oh like I used to watch it, you know, every day before I went to college or before, at that time, 2001, no, 2001, I was watching it when I went to, uh, when I was working in production, I'd watch it every morning before I went to production. So, and then when I got to the, the studio, I would turn it on in the client room. So I would watch it and just see what was going on. So like, it, it blows my mind that it's somebody that I saw on TV. It's become a friend of mine, you know? <laughs> no, it's well, thank God. You know, it's been good. I mean, you've been so great coming on and talking about the mess with us over the years. So it's, it's, it's been, it's been a great relationship, but yeah, no, it's, 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 it, I'm still, uh, I'm glad I'm able to do it. You know, it's, it's, it, you know, and it's funny, like I, I look back then, I mean, I said, you know, you still grow and no matter, I'm 53 years old, I've been doing it for 30 years now broadcasting. I'm still trying to like get better at it. You know what I mean? You, you still, yeah. Oh, I say, uh, too much. Or, you know, you, 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 you listen to yourself, you try and improve writing everything. So it's always, it's like a work in progress. That's funny how it works, you know, and your yeah, bosses that's... remind you of that too. So don't worry. <laughs> yeah. It's like, um, my, uh, my mother-in-law was watching the first show that we did. So the first show that we did, we had John Sapanero with us and I was doing it for my parents' basement up in Pennsylvania. So we me, my wife, my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law, my two nephews went up to Pennsylvania for the weekend. I'm like, you know what? I just want to start doing this. I'm doing the show tonight. So my mother-in-law was watching the show with my wife upstairs, and she goes, all Keith keeps doing is touching his chin and playing it like <laughs> – I'm like, oh, it's something that's just happening. I can't help it. You know, it's – it's. I'll do that even if I'm talking to you. Like if we were at Starbucks just having a conversation, I'll just sit there and, you know, just do it. It's like a, a tick of mine. Yeah, we all, have, you know, we all have mannerisms like I, it's weird. One thing that happened to me was so New York one also has a Spanish channel, no New York one noticias and our mic flags. You don't really see it too often, but one side says New York one and one side says New York, New York one noticias. So when they gave us these new mic flags out of habit, I started always looking down to make sure I had the right side. Stick. <laughs> so you would anyone who's who watched me years ago would notice I always go this. 
<laughs> it looks like so it looks a little, yeah, a little weird, you know. But, but uh, I think I got over it though because they gave us new mic flags that don't have the notices on it, and I think your mind, I through mental, you know, like you know, memory. Now I'm not looking down at it, so now I probably have some other thing I do. But that was pretty bad for a while though. Like my crew would be like, "Stop it!" You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it it's like one of those things where you're just you're just so used to something. You're like, "All right, I gotta I gotta make sure I gotta make sure." Oh wait, I don't have to look anymore, but I'm still gonna make sure because I want to make sure. Right, exactly. And oh, you're right. You know, your pet, like my dad is my 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 biggest critic. Like he lives on Staten Island. He's like, I, I he's basically Archie Bunker. You know, that's that's <laughs> bad. And like, I, I, he'll call and he'd be like, uh, that that shirt. What's with the shirt? And I'm like, what what, do you, what shirt are you referring to, Dad? That's just the thing today. And I was like, it, it was like three days ago. I wanted to what he's talking about. Like he has no idea. What, but it, he always. But you know what? It's cool. I love the fact that he like actually cares to watch. You know, it's nice. So it's nice. He always says when he ends the phone calls, "This is so nice." He always goes, "Well, I'll be, I'll be looking for you." And that's not. Yeah, it's like a nice thing yeah. for that to say. But, but then he's like, "You look fat." So, you know, <laughs> it's Dad, it, camera adds t- adds ten pounds to you. You should know that by now. He, he, but his thing is like, you know, I guess because he used to, you know, have a drink or two back in the day. Like, he's like, what'd you hit the gin mill last night? I see you have rosy cheeks. And I'm like, dad. It's 20 degrees out. Right. I, I don't think that's related to, you know, but it's like, you got a Budweiser tan, you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, I, he um, may have been right once or twice, but. Uh... Well, I, I do have another mother-in-law story for you. Oh, please. You were, you were doing this, uh some kind of spot out in Staten Island. I don't know what you were doing, but my mother-in-law calls me up and she's like, I saw Roger Clark before. I was going to go up and say hi to him, but I didn't know what to say. I'm like, hi, Roger. I'm Keith's uh, mother-in-law. I watch you on SNY, uh, on NY1. Um, you know, I love your stuff. She goes, yeah, I should have said that. Oh, does she live in Staten Island? She does. My, that's where my wife and my, uh, my in-laws know. are all from. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, my dad's still there. Yeah, that's where the whole cl- all the Clarks come from, from Staten Island, yeah. yeah so I'm, I'm shocked that I haven't run out, out to you on there. Uh, I've, lived, <laughs> I've always lived a double life. Like, you know, it's like I, I mostly I tell people I'm from Queens, but really, I mean, I lived there in Staten Island until I was seven, and we went there almost every weekend, you know. So it, it's – and I'm not ashamed of it, but it's more like it just doesn't come up as much because, honestly, most people have never been there. It's crazy. <laughs> But I, I literally like, oh, yeah, well, one time I went to Great Adventure and we drove through. I'm like, <laughs> what? Like, I saw it. My, my father took me to see the dump. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, it's like, and I was just like, how is that possible? But I guess it, it, I guess it is possible that you wouldn't go, you know, if you really, if you had no relatives there or friends. Like, hey, I mean, you could avoid it, I guess. I spent, before I met my wife and even when I met my wife, the most time I've been out in Staten Island is shooting TV shows. Right, for work, right? Yeah. I've been out there for Law & Order, Law & Order SVU, Gotham. Um, Gotham is – so if you, anybody that watched Gotham where they uh, turned Butch into Solomon Grundy, no, that no, was a swamp. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, I'm taking you out of the stream now. <laughs> <laughs> so when they turned Solomon, him into Solomon Grundy, it was near the gas tanks on the other end of Staten Island. Oh, on the Western sure. Expressway, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they, they dug out a big hole and put a pool in there for him to go into the swamp so he wasn't really in that water. There's a lot of good locations. I know they do a lot of Wagner College because it kind of has an Ivy look to it. I think uh, they've filmed a lot. You know, and when someone goes away to school and stuff, they'll go there. And, and you know, obviously by the ferry, that's pretty iconic over there with the, with the view, like working girl on the ferry and the whole thing. But... Yeah. No, I mean, they, you know, it's believe it or not. And I tell people this all the time. Staten Island has really beautiful parks, like mm-hmm. great parks. Like, you know, we can go hiking and get lost like nice places. There's good food. I love the pizza there. Joe and Pat's pizza is like my favorite pizza on the, on the planet. And I mean, there are certain there's things there's stuff there. Like there's some nice little museums. There's a great like China. Uh, I think it's a Asian scholars garden at the at the uh, Snug Harbor. Yep. So it's not like it's like someplace that's just a bunch of houses, you know, and a highway in the middle, you know. Yeah, we filmed Gotham at Snug Harbor. Um, my favorite place, believe it or not, is where the, the ship graveyard is. 
Yeah, that's back almost close to where my dad grew up. Yeah, in Mariners Harbor. Yeah. Yeah, it's just awesome because like you just look out into the water and you're like, wow, that that's history. You don't know actually how old some of the ships are, but you're just like, that's history sitting out there. And it's just like one of my most peaceful points where we were filming. Um, I was working on an SVU and I was out there and I just got to sit in a 15 pass van and just like watch the water and and look at the boats. Yeah, actually, you know, years ago when I was the Staten Island reporter when I first started, we covered a story nearby, and this was crazy. There was a pack of wild dogs loose over that part of Staten Island, and they had actually snuck into the Staten Island Zoo and killed animals there. It was mm-hmm. crazy. This true story. So, my boss goes, "Okay, I want you to find the dogs." <laughs> I'm like, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> like, what if they get me? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, it's going to be a great story if they get you. It was like an exclusive interview with the wild dogs before they they maul me to death, you know. <laughs> but it was really crazy. But yeah, anyway, but I, I never found them. Thank God. Well, that's another funny story. My wife's father, he was the original caretaker of the Staten Island Zoo. Oh, get out! That's crazy. Yeah, uh, when they first built it. My mom's famous story with me over there is that when I was a kid, a uh, little baby, the snow leopard peed on me, <laughs> which I was like, are you sure there just wasn't a leaky ceiling? She's like, no, the leopard peed on you. And I, I'm like, OK, so I don't know if that was good luck, bad luck. You know. Believe it or not, the only time I've been there was working on Mr. Popper's penguins. Oh, they filmed that there? They filmed some of it there, yeah. Cool. It's a nice little zoo. It's a nice little zoo. You know, they do the whole Chuck thing every year. Except, you know, I mean, think about it. Like, <laughs> I, uh, what? So, <laughs> so remember when the, um, the groundhog decided to to get away from De Blasio? Oh man, yeah. So the guy in the red suit, the um, the guy that's in the red suit, that's my wife's cousin. Oh, the guy who's like, wait, not Ryan Leyland? No, um, John. He's he's all dressed up in the uh, oh, yeah, like yeah. The, the pomp and circumstance suit, you know. That's my that's my wife's cousin. Oh my god, that's so crazy! I can see how like entrenched they are in Staten Island. It, very, they're like all very small world over there. They used to her family used to uh, own Clove Stables. Oh, get out! Oh my gosh! Wow. And then, here's another. You know, we're just keep going down the the media goon rabbit hole. So my dad, who was up from the Upper East Side, Yorkville. Growing up, he loved horses. He used to go take the ferry way out to Clove Stables and trade trade work to be able to ride the horses. And he never knew my mother-in-law or my fo- uh, my father-in-law or the family, but he used to go there all the time. Wow, so he would like go ferry, bus, to horse. <laughs> yep. That's amazing. Well, that's a, Yeah, that is a small world that they didn't even know each other. Yeah, it's crazy. And, you know, and when my... And then when I was talking about the house up in Pennsylvania, my mother-in-law used to go up to Lackawaxon where my house is when she was younger. It's so it's just like this whole like weird universal thing where it's just like kept hitting. So it was meant to be, obviously. Yeah, the only bad thing is she's from Staten Island. <laughs> it all goes back to that, right? <laughs> yeah. I know, you know, oh, yeah, well, especially in the past couple of years with all the politics and stuff, it was tough to, uh, you know, like, you, you like hear people complaining about, oh, those 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 jerks on Staten Island. And I was like, yeah, my dad. <laughs> well, we don't mean that jerk. <laughs> not him. Not the other Roger Clark. He's Roger Clark, too. So it's funny. But yeah, no, I mean, you know, you know what happens with family. You just have to you try you try to not talk about politics because it just, you know. It's, it's, you know, stick to like the other things like, Roger, you're fat. Like, don't talk about politics. You know? You're fat and you look like you got the Budweiser tan again. <laughs> Anything else? That, you, know, that is, you know, look, it's all about love, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and therapy. <laughs> well, it's like my parents, you know, my dad always had a feeling that I was going to do something in entertainment. And he worked as a, a teamster for 17 years in the film business. Before that, he was a mover for almost 40 years. Um, so, but when I was a kid, like I was maybe five years old and I was watching the behind the scenes on the making of Empire Strikes Back. And my mom used to like go nuts. She's like, why are you watching so much TV? I'm like, well, I'm want, I love watching this. TV is never going to get you a job. 
Well, you, we have similar paths though, because I watched a lot of TV too. You know, I was like, you know, latchkey kid. My, my, you know, my my parents were divorced. My mom worked. She didn't come up to like six o'clock at night. So we got home from school at three. And what did you do? You know, you do your homework, but then you're watching, as we spoke earlier, Brady Bunch, Partridge Family, all that stuff. And that becomes your babysitter in a crazy way. And then you, you know, then you all of a sudden the news comes on and you're watching the news. You're like, oh, this is pretty intriguing. So next thing you know, with you is also just the artistry and the magic that goes into making these things. And look, that's what you do now. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It, you know, and, it's, you know, I spent eight years doing TV production on those commercials. So that's how I learned how to do all this, you know, like editing and videos and it's still my passion that's why i'm doing stuff like this um it helped me out with the qbc you know running it oh gosh uh, nobody believes that that all comes out of my brain like the whole setup and everything <laughs> <Damn. That'll> be- <laughs> i think i i i can believe it no that, you know that was such a great event it was such a fun part and it was great like i, I was kind of like you you put me in such a great position that i was sitting next to egg crane pool for a half hour that was pretty cool Oh, yeah, great. I mean, uh, little egg cream pool right here. Oh, get out! Oh, wow, look at that. That was really fun. He was cool. He was really yeah. Cool. I, you know, I've had more interactions with him, I think, than any other former Met because I've been to his house. I did the um, raising money for his kidney, you know, to help him get a kidney, and he's he was at two QBCs. Do you remember his his um. Because we in 2015 we did a whole week of basically when my boss what was a Mets fan back then the old news director and he said go crazy do Mets every day, so we did we somehow got into his house in Long Island and typically we don't leave the five boroughs like there's like a gate like it's like an invisible force field that that at, like oh you cannot go to across the bar you know the border, but we went to his house and I couldn't believe his collection of memorabilia it was it was ridiculous, wow. Yeah, the, the well, good thing just let us have the run of the place. He was great. <laughs> it, 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 you could tell that like he was very proud of a lot of his stuff. Yeah, and and I was very happy to hear that when he was selling like stuff to raise money, he wasn't selling anything that like really meant anything to him. Like really meant meant stuff to him. Yeah, it was more of like, hey, I got this picture of uh, these two boxers that signed it to me, or you know, I have. I actually had a jersey hanging up from the Brooklyn Cyclones. There was 11 baseball players, you know, between Tuffle, Duffy Dyer, um, I think uh, Cleon Jones. But there was like 10 different signatures on it that I bought off of him. So I actually have something from his collection. Yeah, it was cool to hear it. Like, you know, it was crazy to like uh, his stories about the 60s and about like who he hung out with because – you thought about it. It was in New York was a baseball town. And, you know, he is, you know, hanging out with he hung out with Mickey Mantle and Joe DiMaggio and all these like almost everybody. And then people from other sports, too. Like he just was like rambling on about like you know, Rolf Frazier and this guy and that guy. It was really crazy. It was like, wow. Yeah. Hey, hey Dave, I heard that you just got the uh, bat signal. So thank you for hanging out. Roger. It was good seeing you. Hopefully. Dave, it was a pleasure, man. Mm, that'd be nice. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Dave. I'll see you later, buddy. All right, so yeah, he got the bat signal. So I don't want to keep you on much longer if you have stuff to do. But uh, it, it was definitely a great time talking to you, Roger. Yeah, Keith, same here. Thank you for having me. This was such a pleasure. Gosh, wow, what a, what fun! I hope we could do it again. <laughs> oh, totally. I'll have you on any day of the week. Um, so how how do you think I'm doing now as a, a little bit of a host? Since I hate being in front of a camera. Excellent. I mean, this has been a good uh, flowing conversation. That's the key, you know. It's the you know the key. Is you know yeah. the, about? I always like you, you. I always when you're asking questions, you don't want the questions to be too long because then next thing you know, you, people forget what you asked. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, <laughs> too. So no, I, yeah, I, I try not to when I'm interviewing people. I, I try to get to kind of get to the point quickly. You know, not to I, you. You don't want to like say blah 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 like prove that you know something that they don't know and then throw it in their face or something. Like that. Yeah, I you know I don't do any prep work, believe it or not. I just go off the top of my head. Like I know where I want to go and what I want to say, but I just don't do anything. I feel it's more, more natural and it, um, it, it works a little better for me. All right, Keith, one morning before I go, I did that with that. So I covered the all-star fan fest uh, the year the Mets, it was at uh, city field and Mo- I interviewed Mookie Wilson. And this is one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. I said to Mookie, I said, so 
uh, this is so exciting. The All-Star Game's in town. Tell us about your All-Star experience. And he says, I never was at an All-Star Game. And I had no, I, I just assumed Mookie was at an All-Star Game. <laughs> See, I would have covered up. No, I didn't mean about you being in the game. I mean, what do you think about this all-star experience? Yeah, what have you done here? I messed up. Yeah. But he was so – talk about a nice guy and who, and he didn't – he's like, you idiot. I wasn't in an all-star game. He was just like, well, I never played an all-star game, Roger. But let me tell you, it's, I know that the, the guys I know who played – like he just rolled it right straight into it, no problem. And I always was impressed by that day. He did because I felt like an idiot, but he didn't make me feel like an idiot more. <laughs> Well, he we had him at the uh, second ever QBC, him and um, Backman. Oh wow, yeah, that's a good group. And and, um, you know, he was great. You know, and the second QBC, like I, I I fell my footing over after the first one. I was, I was fine with the first one, but with the second one, I was just like, man, we're actually doing something here. And I wasn't nervous about having any of the players, but it was good. Like for the two seconds, I had time to actually talk to him, to talk to him, and I was like. You know, I watched this guy play when I was in, you know, uh, 10 years old in 86. This is awesome that standing next to me, he's talking to me like I'm a peer and not just a, a fan. Yeah. And those, and I think, you know what, the good ones are like that. And that's the most, that's the thing. And they, and a lot of them are like, you know, that, that same year we interviewed Edgardo Alfonso. He was a sweetheart. I mean, I, I can't think of too many over the years that I wasn't, uh, you know, I well, I screwed up with Al Leiter because I had a lighter. You know those Jersey T-shirts that are cheesy. Like, I randomly at Models had a lighter because he had 22, and that was my high school baseball number. So I finished the interview and I say, "Oh, Al, um, I have a shirt with your number and name on it." And he just looks at me like, "Okay, creepy." <laughs> <laughs> so that was not professional. It was my fault by not. I wasn't being professional, but it was very difficult to interview someone I liked and looked up to, and not say something so you know but i've gotten better with that over the years you know yeah but that that's what makes it makes you you and it makes it fun to watch you on doing your um your spots on the news is that you could tell that whatever story you're doing it might not be something that you know is right down your alley but you actually get interested in it and you show interest in it and whatever it is you're actually excited about doing that story yeah. And I think that's, you know, and, and it's only, it's, it's in a way I, you know, I feel like it's a learning experience, you know, like I, it, it may be something that I wouldn't necessarily jump into myself, but then you get there and you talk to the people involved, you feel their passion and you hear what they, and like, you know, you know I, I would, I wouldn't say I was a big art fan growing up when I was a kid, you know, it wasn't like I was constantly going to museums and stuff, you know, I mean, we just didn't do that. I didn't come from that kind of family, but as covering art now, now I like it. I like it much more because I've talked to artists and I've talked to like museum curators and I've learned about how they do it and how they fix it. And then next thing you know, you're like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So you do. You, exactly. It makes you feel a little more passionate about something that maybe you necessarily didn't feel passionate about in the past, you know? Yeah. Well, speaking about art, since Majo is now off of here, I can actually be nice. Um, I have him and I have graphics joker, you know, they're two great artists and you know, I'm not, I can I can doodle I can draw a little bit but like I talk to them in on the side about stuff and I I'm learning about art I'm learning about NFTs I'm learning about all this other stuff with them and it's now that stoked me with this art stuff where I'm like all right now I want to learn more so I understand what you're saying like the the stories put you down a path now you're like oh wow this sounds great you know let me check this out more and I'm I'm really enjoying it since I understand it more well, yeah, absolutely. You know, and, you know, and it's good. You, you know, I think I took like one like art class in, in high school and they made us go to the Met and do a scavenger hunt. And thank God for that one class, because now, now at least I kind of sound semi knowledgeable about it when I'm places. But then sometimes you don't. And, you know, it's going to happen where you're not, you know, I mean, if I'm talking to like the head paleontologist at the Museum of Natural History, he knows everything about dinosaurs. <laughs> I mean, like he literally does. There's nothing I could say that's so I just try and soak up what he's you know, hit the knowledge and I ask questions, you know, and I'm not afraid to ask questions. And look, if I sound like kind of a dope every once in a while, it's it, it, I, I, usually they're pretty cool about it. And, you know, they don't rub it in your face that like, oh, God, this guy doesn't know about dinosaurs. Instead, they actually get a kick out of teaching. And, and those are the people you like to talk to the best because, you know, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, but but when you ask like a dopey question it's not really dope because somebody out there might have that question. 
Yeah. And that's always my take on it. Like, I'm like you, I'm not saying I don't do any preparation, but I feel like, I feel like I want to sound like, be a little surprised sometimes, you know, I don't want to like go into, you know, if I'm going to be interviewing, like, like I said, someone who knows a lot about this particular topic, why am I going to try and outshine them? <laughs> but, you know, I want to be, I want to learn from them, you know, it's, and then I could share it with the viewers. It's cool. You know? Yeah. That's just like what I'm doing with this is I'm trying whoever I have on as a guest, I'm trying to learn more about people that I know. So like, you know, John Sapinaro is a buddy of mine, a comedian, um, live event host. And I wanted to know more about him. And on here, like, I'm just like, Hey, let me find out stuff. I don't know about you. <laughs> um, uh, last week, who do I have on the second week? I had, uh, ah, I'm blanking out. Who do we have on? Ah, it'll come back to me later. Oh, I had Mark Healy. I had Mark oh, Healy on last week. Oh, I love Mark. He's great. So Mark, you know, great book. I read. Too. Yeah, I, that's what we talked about. <laughs> I, I, I had such a great line on him. He goes, "Oh, what you, what did you like most about the book?" I'm like, "When you got mugged." He goes, "Which time?" I'm like, "All three. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, he's a character. <laughs> I did, I did this, the story. Um, I think it was like last spring when because he had the book out. Brian Wright had the great book out. Mm -hmm. And then, um, oh my God, my buddy Mike also had a book out about, uh, so it was crazy. So I had all three of them in the piece. It was really yeah. it was a good time for releasing books. <laughs> yeah. The pandemic book club. Right. Exactly. Yeah. They, they, they made like this whole, uh, this whole section out and trying to keep promoting each other to keep pushing out those books. So hopefully they'll be able to have some sort of a signing and, uh, push them this season. Yeah, I hope so because yeah, they they all did. A, I mean, they were all they. We were really lucky. It was that we get, there was some good, good Mets books. It was nice. <laughs> well, we were supposed to have an artist panel, uh, an artist panel, which we did do in the QBC virtual version. We were going to have an author's panel, and we were going to have them all talking about their books. Yeah, that's a great idea. And they, those guys could all talk. I mean, they, uh, they could talk about everything. They're, they're good stuff. Yeah. So, all right, Roger. Um, I've had you on, I've actually held you hostage for almost an hour and 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so much for a half an hour show, huh? Well, it was, um, nice. it was really seriously. Thanks for asking. It was a pleasure. And of course, I, I hope uh, I'll be seeing you out at City Field and doing some interviews with you on New York One, too. <laughs> uh, I can't wait. I just hope to be able to stand six feet away from you and watch a game with you. Oh, that'd be a blast. I'm ready. I'm ready. Get me in there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Roger, I'm going to take you off the stream now. I'm going to talk to you right after this for a few seconds. And then uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. Thank you for being on, Roger. Thank you for Maggio for ditching out on us. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you in a second, Roger. Okay.